if we make a difference locally, we can see that difference. And one of the big issues we have with the with the climate crisis and the social crisis, particularly climate, is that there are no immediate feedback loops. Uh, you know, so I go out and I recycle every day. Climate change is still happening. <laughs> you know, the, the, you can't see how you're making a difference. So there's something really interesting. Uh, and, uh, it's almost like we're being forced down a different route as entrepreneurs, I would argue, that um, that is very exciting. And, and that leads to this idea of a regenerative um, society or economy. <laughs> Louise Kellerup Roper is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Louise is the CEO of Volans. She leads the team and is responsible for Volans entire mission, programs and strategy, and ensuring Volans has the biggest possible positive impact through what we do and how they work with anyone everywhere. After leaving her native Denmark to study PPE at the University of Oxford, Louise started her career with leading edge software companies such as Cisco and Checkpoint Software Technologies before focusing in on the role of business for good, launching Cradle to Cradle and B-Lab pioneering companies like method and G diapers into Europe and bringing circular economy business models and scale to ambitious small businesses. Luis is a guest lecturer at both Cranfield University and the University of Exeter and part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's CE100 network. She also mentors young change makers via the Aspire Foundation and the Aspire Trailblazing Women's Network. Now, with Cradle to Cradle, that's William McDonough, Bill McDonough, one of my good friends, my mentors. Uh, he's also an architect on one of my projects and his, his companies. And it happened to be that Michael Braungart is actually at the Loifana University here in Hamburg, where I live. And so it's wonderful to see your connections to those. And I'm sure... There's a lot of cross-cutting friends and acquaintances that, that we have over the years. But Luis, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Mark. It's really good to be here. It took a little while to organize, huh? But yeah, no, it's it's great to be here. And it's actually, as you're reading that out, the, um, you know, the cradle to cradle piece has been really important. And I sometimes think we don't talk about Michael and Bill enough because uh, they've really created a systems change that I don't think anybody had anticipated by, you know, with the book, with the movement. And then, as Mike would say, letting the anarchy begin and letting people own it and push it out into the world. I, you know, I think they're amazing leaders in systems change, really. Uh, absolutely, they are. And, and it's it's crazy what a small world we we find ourselves in. A lot of cross-cutting acquaintances and people that we work with these sustainability movements these uh, circular economy movements are believe it or not pretty small even though it sounds you know world changing very uh, um, large movements they're actually pretty small groups and everybody's kind of connected um, and, and we're just trying to get the word out of there um uh, how, with your involvement with Ellen MacArthur uh, Foundation and CE100, Bill McDonough basically kind of led the way on the whole circular economy. I mean, cradle to cradle is very circular in concept, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of that came with that. How mm -hmm. how is that going? How have you found that development, and, and why do you think we're not talking about it uh, enough? Um, so. Oh, so yes, absolutely. Cradle to Cradle was the foundation of circular economy. And I think the Ellen MacArthur Foundation did a great job of saying, oh, we can take this and actually commercialize it a little bit more and make it understandable and create a network of companies that could learn about this, which is which I was really lucky um, to be involved in quite early when they started. And um, I don't think we're talking about it enough because it's complicated. <laughs> and and because there is in this very small community really of change makers and sustainability 
type people uh, like you and I, there there is a hesitancy sometimes to push an agenda onto normal conversations, um, and and to start explaining, oh, this is the circular economy. People say, well, you mean recycling then? Um, is is almost the first ever, you, you know, it's like, well, no. Circular means that you are designing something with a systems lens so that it can be um, reused. But yeah, I'm I'm amazed at how many intelligent people who are not in this space don't really talk about it or know what it is. So I think there's still a, a huge job um, of communicating. I think the last time I heard, from um, Andrew at the EMF, he said that about less than 10% of the economy is, you know, worldwide is still circular. So we've got, we've got a little while to go. <laughs> I'm glad we've that- got a long while. They just came out with, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation just came out with Circulitics. Uh, mm. It's kind of an analytic uh, system. And uh, I've had a couple, couple of great people from them on as well talking about that. So there's constantly new reports, new data analytics and tools that are out there to spread the world. But I'm finding the exact same thing. We're not talking about enough. There's not enough understanding. I, I advise a company, a couple companies out of Israel, but um, they they really want to uh, take care of all their scope one, two, and three, uh, take care of their reporting. They want to do recycling. They want to make sure that they, as an organization, are structured in a way that's good. There's no recycling in all of Israel. It's all cradle to grave. It's and 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 so they. Uh, and, and I'm running into this more and more. And I want, and the reason I'm bringing it up, I kind of want to see how you're running it. You guys advise numerous uh, companies out there that we have these great innovators, these great startups, great companies that really want to start out on the very first foot or the beginning of what they do in a very sustainable, environmentally friendly way. They come up with super innovations. But now as they go to scale and get to market and apply those, they're realizing that uh, infrastructure is not even there. The policy, the laws, the labeling, the 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 infrastructure to, to get it to scale or to, to kind of convert it, that's not even there. And now they're having to be lawmakers, policymakers. They have to create the infrastructure. They have to create the recycling system um, in their whole community uh, and, I mean, this the same company as well. They had to create a whole uh, bus uh, type of electric bus system just for transport to kind of have a sustainable way to get to work and back. No, that's exactly it. It's exactly. It. And funnily enough, what you're describing is actually the reason why I got I went from working with two. So um, cradle to cradle um, product companies. So method. Uh, method products and soaps and so on and, and one of the issues we had when we introduced the refills for the laundry detergent into Europe was it wasn't recyclable the stuff in the system in the European system so had to create our own <laughs> literally our own um, way of getting the materials back and then what were we going to do with them and and so you end up and that is seriously the story that took me from cradle to cradle into circular economy because it was so obvious you had to think about um the whole system and and similarly with g diapers you know diapers nappies that compost in the soil within three months most nappies never disappear because they're full of plastic yeah so you could in theory put them in in i live in london so you could put them in the food recycling bin and they would actually be good for the composting there but i couldn't Oh, I couldn't, and I couldn't uh, convince the council to allow that to happen because of the risk of contamination. So that means you have these beautiful products invented that are just as bad, let's be honest, for or, or close to as bad for the environment effectively because there's no system to, to make use of the, the attributes, the cradle to cradle attributes or the circular potential. Um, and, and so it means that entrepreneurs now there has, I think there has been a huge shift from, oh, you can create this and isn't it great and rely on policy, et cetera, to having to think differently about scale and think, well, maybe um, if I could in this area um, get a local change in the policy or convince or whatever, you know, work with a local ecosystem to make something work, whether, you know, whether it's recycling or, 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 um, or something else that, that can make the product 
at its you know perform at its best for the for the world so you have to do that locally and then replicate rather than think oh yeah we're going to just scale this up which has been this model um for years and years you know you if you're a startup what you need to do is scale as fast as you can and sell like that has been the model so so it's it's interesting and in a way it's a different challenge for entrepreneurs, but it's also, there's something really good about it <laughs> because that is where we have to go. We have to stop thinking that everything is about efficiency and scale and look at quality. And and somebody um, used the word proximity the other day, which I love. It's like, we have to think about the proximity of our of our products to the, you know, to the local community, to the local environment. And we can then, overcome a different problem for climate change and social change, which is we get much better feedback loops. If we make a difference locally, we can see that difference. And one of the big issues we have with the with the climate crisis and the social crisis, particularly climate, is that there are no immediate feedback loops. Uh, you know, so I go out and I recycle every day. Climate change is still happening. <laughs> you know, they, they, you can't see how you're making a difference. So there's something really interesting. Uh, and, uh, it's almost like we're being forced down a different route as entrepreneurs, I would argue, that um, that is very exciting and, and that leads to this idea of a regenerative um, society or economy, that, that uh, which is what, you know, we at Volans are working for all the time is trying to nudge those conditions in the right direction. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I agree. We don't see those feedback loops quick enough. But what we what we do see if it, if the products are done right is that it doesn't go cradle to grave. You never see your products in the graveyard or in the landfill or somewhere laying on a curb or in the oceans or, or somewhere where it comes back because mm -hmm. you've pre thought of that. Um, Where's it going? Who? Where's it going to end up? How's it going to come back to me? How can we keep it in 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 that technical cycle or that organic cycle, and keep it in in kind of a closed system? Now, I I feel in some respects for for those who maybe are unaware of Bolins that we might have gotten gotten ahead of ourselves, and I have to caveat, even though we know each other, maybe there are some listeners that are out there who are like. Volans and, and uh, Cradle to Cradle and uh, Ellen MacArthur and um, what is it? Uh, you are the CEO of Volans and uh, which is affiliated with John Elkington. It's an organization that really um, has regenerators. It's really advising businesses and and everyone. You could probably tell us better than I can to push transformations, to push training, education, to get people thinking about the topics that we've already jumped into yeah. in advance to prepare them to be better businesses for good, to prepare them to uh, think of a lot of things. And it's really a lot under the guise of, uh, you know, this is one of John's latest books, Green yeah. Swans. Um, where he talks about the recall of the triple bottom line, which he did in 2018, which was a 25-year uh, process, um, or it was around for 25 years before he, before, before he recalled it. And so I want you to tell us a little bit more about Volans and about that, that mission, a little bit about the regenerators, and then I want to go in to this recall in 2018 of the triple bottom line and kind of go a little bit more because with a recall, there should always be something that sure. replaces or fixes that recall. We want sure. a little bit more history there. Okay, I can do that. It's all beautifully linked. Thank you. So yes, Volans, um, I'm the CEO. I joined in uh, 2017, so five years ago. Um, it was founded by John in 2008. Um, and a couple of his colleagues from from his old company, Sustainability, as well as um, someone who was very senior at the World Economic Forum and the Schwab Foundation, uh, Pamela. Uh, so they founded it and we still have, um, to a large degree, the same mission, which is about catalyzing systemic change. Um, the way we do that tends to be through businesses. We work with other organizations and straight businesses, but mostly through business. And we we do two things. One is we have a sort of think tank um, 
work stream, which tries to look further into the future than any sensible business should, <laughs> um, to look at what's coming and, and start thinking about that, um, which is always interesting. So we had fun with, did a big um, piece for the World um, Business Council for Sustainable Development, which came out uh, October 2019, which was 10 big disruptors, one economic crisis, two risk of war, three global pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So those kinds of things, not very, very deep research, but synthesizing and looking at disruptions and what's coming trends. And then the other piece, which is, is closely linked, they're not separate at all, is we then work with ambitious businesses to help them think through what that means and get on the front foot um, in their personal transfer or sort of organizational transformation to be to create the system that's needed for them both to be successful, but but more than that, to have a world that's going to exist um, for further generations. Um, so so that's the the whole piece of it. It sort of links together. So the work we do, we test it with clients. Some of our thinking, we learn from from doing things in practice, and then we feed it back. I always say that we have three kind of pillars. One is we're always based on research and insight. Secondly, our approach, and I think that's what distinguishes us from, from others, is very creative and very focused on humans, on unlocking the insights that are within an organization. And really, we've got some fantastic tools and, and, um, and processes we run with, which are fun. And then the third piece is that we try and be really practical in our application. So, so we've, we do do books, um, we do reports and so on. But really, most of the work is kind of under the radar in that it's it's practical work for organizations. Um, and there's a lot of it. The my thesis has been for a few years that every every single company, however good it looks on the outside, um, is in need of sub, you know, a bigger transformation than we can even imagine, even volans, even though I've set it up in to create a regenerative conditions for my team and, and for our clients, we, there is transformation needed across the board. So, so it's quite fun and we have to pick very carefully. We're very small, we're based in London, but we, we work globally. So we try and, and pick things that a have that potential for systemic change that is regenerative. Um, and that it's people that we can work with and we really like, which always surprises people. Like, well, surely you have clients you don't like, and it, it, we really don't. I, I I genuinely think they're all marvelous people, because we can't do this difficult work and look into the future and take a whole organization with us if there isn't mutual respect, trust, and fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, times are too tough to to not have fun at work. It would be my view. So yeah. that's. Yeah, that that's that's absolutely beautiful. And I know you guys have I mean, before we get to the triple bottom line and kind of that, you guys have really worked with the who's who's of organizations and you you although we spoke before and you said, you know, I haven't read that book or I haven't read that you guys read a lot and you read a lot of reports, you're involved in a lot of front running things. I know John just had um not too long ago, a, a podcast with uh, the founder of Patagonia, and uh, wow, yeah. the the new announcement that just amazing, came out it? there was a, um, amazing things. And so, and I could go on and on. You have a fellow Daniel Christian Wall, a uh, regenerating, uh, yeah. um, designing regenerative cultures, yeah. and he's a now f a part of the fellow of you guys and. Um, you yeah. the uh, the other accolade that I really have have to mention is that you guys received the B Corp Best for the World Governance Recognition, recognition which is um, not only do you do the work, you have the podcast, you're connected, but you're also receiving the accolades and the recognition as being a front runner in the uh, thought leaders and the, this think tank movement of of what's going on. And John has been doing this a long time uh, um, and uh, has made it, hopefully has made it a little bit easier, the path that that has oh, no. has went there to to set up everything and his connections in that. But uh, um, it's just get, trying to get humanity on the right side of history and businesses, especially what can we do? And so uh, I, 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 I just uh, am astounded 
every time I see what you guys are doing and who's there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's all kind of led up to this thought leader, this front runner in the triple bottom line that, that then in 2018 was recalled. And I, I know that you have, you have a strategy or a plan that was there. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and I found it, but I, I think some others might be hard pressed to have seen that in the past. So. Right. Yeah. No, we haven't actually published that much in detail on it. It's me- it's mentioned in John's book from 2020, uh, the Green Swans book, but really it all came out of um, inquiry. One of these thought leadership projects we took on, um, which we were lucky enough to get sponsored by uh, Unilever, Aviva, The Body Shop, Covestro, um, and a couple of other uh, others. And the question we asked ourselves was, what will it take for businesses to catalyze systemic change? How can a business become a catalyst? And there were lots of conclusions and I can, I, I, I'll touch on some of them. And um, and one of the things that we, as we dug into this, um, because John had, um, had coined this term, the triple bottom line, people, planet and profit, 20, five or 24 years actually earlier when we started the project um we we also looked at that because that has been and now it's sort of reflected in the esg piece right environmental social and governance um you and and the triple bottom line had 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 set off this movement within sustainability around reporting on the impact not just profit but reporting on social impact reporting on environmental impact and um and that was all great but when we looked at it as a tool for cata- catalyzing bigger systemic change, which is what's needed now, it wasn't really doing what it should have done, what you know John in- had intended it to do. It, well, it was being traded off, people saying, yeah, yeah, we'll have profit and then we won't do any harm to the environment, but we'll really focus on our social aspects or sort of rather than looking at it as three things that, that really must work together. And and so partly, and this, you know, it signals some of the playfulness, I guess, that we have in our work. Um, this recall came out, we, um, and through the Harvard Business Review, there, we, there was an article um, where John said, well, I'm going to try and do a product recall because this isn't working for the world. Let's take it back. And and it was astounding, the the um, response, actually. I saw one woman who who heard it live in a conference started crying because she'd built her whole life and or her whole career around um, the triple bottom line and people plan a profit. And, and it was this shock. And John, well, how could you do this? Um, but really what we what we discovered was that there's nothing wrong with the triple bottom line um, as a systemic tool, but you have to use it um, in in a bigger way than how it was being used. And maybe I can explain. So we've, we now talk about it as it has highlighting the three R's. The three R's are responsibility, re, um, resilience, and regeneration. And, and most companies um, really have focused on being responsible, being good companies. And they're the ones who've used the triple bottom line. Um, oh, you know, minimizing negative impact is how it had been used, which is great. Um, and it's great. We have so much more data and transparency from businesses than we had um, 30 years ago before the triple bottom line came into play and all the reporting. You know, we've now got so many EU directives um, and, and US laws now and, and in the UK the same that are pushing reporting and pushing this transparency so we can make real choices, which we didn't have before. So it's great. Responsibility is fine. However, um, it doesn't, as we've seen and we saw strongly it was interesting strongly during um covid and the the whole pandemic and and now in this crisis it doesn't make you for a resilient company because we've we've might have just slowed down um the damage we've done both to society and the environment by treating the triple bottom line in that way and um and actually it reminds me of a quote from now we talked about cradle to cradle the, the cradle to cradle book opens with a quote about sustainability um not being good enough because you're just slowing down your drive <laughs> to the cliff edge of the world and you're basically uh, just drive you're still heading in the wrong direction you're just exactly, going slower exactly yeah. that and and it, and it was a little bit of that and responsibility is a bit like that you know we'll just slow it down and we'll do better than we did last year and really good companies would you know pick up on like the future fit foundations benchmark and say oh we're not benchmarking against 
our industry or ourselves, we're benchmarking against the future and yet still too slow, let's be honest. And then, so when you then look at, okay, so we're gonna be resilient. So resilient, the mindset of that really is, let's then protect ourselves against these awful climate or social disasters. Let's have a great diversity policy or, or you know, or a um, let's onshore our supply chain. So we're not so affected by what's going on with if Asia burns or you know, the, the, that's the resilience mindset. It's still this mindset that companies and business and, and humans are in one place. And then we're, we've got an external nature, an external environment or biosphere an external society. And the resilience has the same output, but it's trying to just protect ourselves. So not do less damage to the weather, that's the responsibility, then you've got the resilience. And I see them by the way as stacked so that you have to have one and then the other. The only way we discovered through our work to really be have a resilient business um, is to shift that mindset and to look for regeneration. And the reason why that's a different, a qualitatively different mindset is you are accepting that you are part of the system, that the business, the organization, the human beings are part of environment and part of society. It's not something external that, that you can, can damage or not damage, because if that is damaged, you are damaged. And, and, and so, so, so we then really started digging into this. Well, what does that mean? That regenerative piece. Um, and, and really it means that the financial we've come back to the to the profit the value creation under the line of profit has to be directly and inextricably linked to the value creation for the environmental system and the social system um not oh i'm going to you know buy one pair of shoes and i'm going to buy some shoes for somebody in africa that's not an inextricable link um your business models have to be set up so that the systems win or, and the, everybody you know and and the you win and that's really different. So, so that for me um, and for, for our clients <laughs> has been a real, really interesting play um, because it's still hard. We, we are so used to seeing externalities, to seeing this outside businesses here. We've got some stakeholders out there somewhere and we can be nice to them or not. Um, breaking that open and seeing seeing businesses within a system is very, very different. So those are the three R's. I hope that was a clear enough explanation. That's perfect, yeah. Um, uh, but there's been a little bit more progress oh, as yeah. well. So there's some other things that you've done in this true transformation that's also going on at the same time. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, that? Yeah, yeah. so just, um, so I guess, so once you start there, then you say, okay, so, so regeneration is creating the conditions for the system to flourish for life to flourish actually um and 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 um, and how do you then transform um what does that mean for a company how do how do you transform for that so we've been working with um some really uh, wonderful very ambitious companies uh, for example the spanish aciona which is an infrastructure company they do everything from build um water sanitation plants to um, the Sao Paulo Metro, you know, really big things, um, energy systems and so on. And they've really, um, they have taken this on board and said, okay, so how do we do this? And all their former sustainability targets, you know, they've gone, okay, so what does this look like with a re regenerative lens as well as a responsibility and a resilience lens? What does it mean for diversity and inclusion? Because if we say that, the, let's say that, the gender balance is 50 50 on a on the management that's responsible but what does that mean how do you do that regeneratively what, what's the difference here so they've re we've really helped them dig into some of those things which are super interesting because the regenerative angle of course is how do you continue to feed so that never stops being a an equal gender balance for example but more interestingly and that's um i think what um what you and i spoke about previously was they are looking at their projects. So saying, okay, instead of taking an order or, or being part of a tender that says, let's build this bridge. And, and, and those tenders from a local authority tend to be the speed, the quality, the price. And, and you know, more and more, maybe a little bit about the carbon emissions, but, but not many other criteria are set up. So what does it look like if you want to have that as a, as a regenerative project? Well, that means you look at the context 
of that local area and you're saying well what do the what does the population need what's the um demographic what is the biodiversity needs what's the financial needs and jobs for those people um and what is that going to be in 10 years so we had a fun one that was a bridge which was you know if you put a bridge in this this town in spain then that's all fine but spain is going to probably be 10 degrees hotter in 10 years so if you put more traffic, um, cars, um, and even if you have EVs, actually most of the the pollution comes from the tires, not the, uh, not just the the tailpipe. Uh, if you have that combined with heat and ten degrees hotter, you're creating a real health risk for that population. So obviously you have to look at that system in a completely different way than responding to a tender. And that's what some company like Athiana, that's what I get excited about because then they're, they're taking that responsibility comes back to the entrepreneur, right? They're taking the responsibility and saying, let's have the bigger conversation with three of the silos in the local authority, the health, as well as the, the planning department. Um, and let's, let's take that long-term view and that broader umbrella. Anyway, that, so th those kind of projects we're doing for some really interesting companies around the world, which is, is great fun. I don't know if you've run into this, but I run into it all the time. It's very difficult when you you have a company like that who is now coming up with a great solution for the the bridge of the future, or what does the yeah. that that crossing crossing the river or uh, a waterway um, look like for the future? Mm -hmm. That now they've come up with a very regenerative, very resilient uh, solution. But they are involving three or four ministries, the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of yeah. Transportation, the Ministry, you know, and, and and so in that process, they go to the Ministry of Transportation. We've got this great thing. We're thinking about the future, but we also need to involve the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Air Quality or mm -hmm. uh, Environment there. And they're like, oh, no, no, that's transportation. Tra stay with transportation. None of those infrastructures, and this is what we talked about earlier, is none of those ministries are on the same page. They're not communicating with each other. They're not sharing monies. They're not sharing that vision for the yep. future. And they don't have no have a unified operating system to, to right. communicate. So this is where the stifle comes in with these organizations. They have this beautiful thing. It's very regenerative, very resilient, future thinking, and... Um, they get caught up in this bureaucratic trap almost uh, to, to move forward. Um, yes. What are you seeing yeah. policy-wise? What are you seeing to help with organizations? Is that, when we talked about it as well earlier, and I wanted to kind of mention that, is that where even though we're creating these regional local projects uh, or businesses mm -hmm. that are coming up with these things, is that where they can then go to a big organization like uh, uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation or to Cradle to Cradle or to the B Corp or something and say, hey, I want to do this. I'm dealing with it locally. But now, look, at I've got this big infrastructure, big system. Can you help? Yeah. What are you um, seeing? So so I'm not seeing that because I don't think um, – at at this point, um, I am seeing what you, as in, I'm not seeing what they're that they're going to to those organisations. What I'm seeing, um, which is really interesting, is that actually this is where finance comes in, finance and policy, in my mind. Um, what I'm seeing is that funding this and wrapping it, it becomes essential. So one of the things we've actually done as a spin-off of of this project with Athiona is create a not just a playbook for the Athiona new business guys of how to have different conversations about regeneration, but a, a kind of toolkit or workshop um, sort of for uh, development banks, because a lot of this stuff is actually within the remit of development banks. So to help them understand how do they, um, how do they navigate these local things? How do they make sure that they could fund truly regenerative systems projects in a different way i think it, i think that's one of the keys um the other piece and i'm going to jump to a scottish project we've been working on actually in the leaven mouth um so leaven mouth is a place in scotland where um which is terribly deprived in all ways um with jobs education the environment and so on 
and the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, which we've been working with for four years now, I think maybe five, um, they have they took a lead and said, we're going to create not just look at the environment, but we're going to create a partnership that um, with private companies like Diageo, who's got a big um, plant up there with this, the Scottish railways, with the local council and create this as a whole system where we, we regenerative, we regenerate everything at the same time, um, which has been in itself super exciting. And to see some of those projects are coming, coming out now, but, the um the thing that gets me even more excited than that is well you can you get investors to look at this as a different asset class so instead of saying yeah we're gonna we want to fund the riverbanks being better or whatever saying well actually we're gonna fund this as a whole system because we can see that having 12 projects rather than one is going to have a synergistic effect and give us more back on our investment money than if we were just funding one little thing. So, th so that's, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the financial pieces, which I think is not underestimated, but sort of, um, I should make, I, actually, I could make a connection here because the, the tomorrow's capitalism inquiry I talked about, which led us to the three R's. One of the other big conclusions from that was that even companies who wanted to, and we're back in 2018, 20, early 20, yeah, uh, 2019, that even big companies who wanted to transform had a plan to transform to something different, to being more regenerative. Um, they didn't know how to explain this to the finance and to banks at all. Um, and my caveat is last couple of years, the finance sector has, has shifted quite substantially. But what we were able to do was to create a, an initiative called Bankers for Net Zero, which we launched in 2019 um, with um, the UK Parliament, one of the parliamentary groups for fair business banking. And we brought together industry and banks to try and figure out how might the regulations, and we did this for the UK specifically to start with, what, how might regulation policy shift the amount of money flowing from banks to, in this in net zero businesses or those types of projects? And that was a really interesting piece because you need the three pods of that chair. You need, you need industry, you need the banks and the finance and you need uh, policy and regulation to back up around this. Um, and that's been really successful. We just spun it out um, earlier this year into its own company, um, the Bankers of Net Zero, which is now part of, sort of under the umbrella of the UN uh, Global Banking Alliance for Net Zero. But those, again, it comes back to collaboration in a really different way um, than what we've seen before. There's always been collaboration, of course, but but kind of always with a knife in your in your back pocket as far as I'm concerned. Pretty competitive. And yet it's a very competitive collaboration. Yeah. And and now um it seems that businesses are in such we are on such a knife edge of a situation and businesses are under such threat from this uncertainty that it's riskier not to collaborate openly. Um, with the whole industry, uh, and and with your with your competitors, and and beyond, far beyond your 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 industry, than it is to to try and hold it on. At least sensible businesses will be doing that, um, and we're seeing more and more of it. Um, we're just again launching a another project around, which will be peer supported. Really, how can companies um, be better advocates? Um, for, in policy for for big systemic changes a little bit I always joke about it and say we're trying to figure out how the fossil fuel industry the tobacco industry and the sugar industry in America in particular what did they do to have such a stranglehold for so many decades and and why and how can we use that for good so that's another little project but again it will be it's a lot of it the knowledge is in those corporations and we can um we can unlock that and, and have them support each other as peers in a safe environment. So we do some of that as well, um, which is exciting because the, the scale of transformation we need is so enormous. And you mentioned, I have to go back to, you mentioned Yvonne from, from Patagonia, who's just announced that he's given the company to a trust to fight climate change, which is extraordinary. And yet, you know, it seemed impossible thing for anybody to do. And yet 
I could see why he, as somebody who's been leading on this for so many years, would think, well, this is inevitable. We we have to, I think, and, and I think we will all be called in the next five years, if not earlier, to do something we would never have imagined um, in the, you know, five years ago or today. That the, the changes needed is is so incredible. And, um, and, and, and giving away your company to fight climate change, you know, you, and if you've heard the, the web, the, the podcast or the video on yeah. our website. So, because one of the things we found actually after we did, we did all this work was people don't know what regeneration is. So we did, so we've done a series of, of interviews and articles just to, to help beef up the that movement and it's the same reason why we were lucky enough to i've known daniel christian val for a, um, a few years and i love his work and so it's the fellowship is not a it's not an acknowledgement of what he has done which has been great it's in order to enable him to work more on this and to think and to help companies um really flourish um with this regenerative thinking because yeah, we've got to do a lot of it. Um, oh, absolutely. He's not only did he get your fellowship, he got another award this year. Oh yeah, the year, RSA. He got a very he got a very RSA. He got a very special award from the RSA, um, the the bicentenary medal, which is amazing. Um, and so we do some work with the RSA, and, and that it's wonderful. Um, our award is more financial because yeah, I, I really wanted it to be something that would take the pressure off him. Um, he's a you know. A brilliant thinker but he's he's he doesn't have a company behind him to support yeah. him he gets asked to do a lot of things for free and and i wanted to, him to be able to to write his next book actually and and continue to do that thinking so, so i that's agree fun. i'm so glad you guys did that i think it's fabulous not and um, that that's what i mean that the type of work you do the transformations the, the people that you have are just um it's it's bottom up it's so it's organizations who really have the power uh to change um, at all different levels and so i, I i'm i'm really glad we could speak again even though i've, I've talked to to john I, I think you bring a whole beautiful breadth into what you do on the day-to-day -day and, and uh, other activities uh for volans there's a lot more transformations going on in your organization than than I, I I think that we know about, besides the ones I've already mentioned. And I think it's pretty bold to say we're not doing projects or not doing different changes. We're actually working on transformations. Can you tell us more why you've chosen that, why transformations are so important? And uh, uh, what's the direction behind that? Oh, um, that's a big question. Uh, I guess it's it's partly necessity. Um, it we did a we did quite a lot of work just when I was joined Volans on sort of exponential change and try, and and how innovations could could drive exponential rather than incremental step by step change, and and it just became apparent that we we don't have time. For incremental change we have time we should all be doing incremental change but where we felt we could contribute most so that's my dog snoring um that's fine <laughs> we um where we could contribute most as an organization and as individuals was to really push ambitious change um into the world and help people do that and and it might be worth just talking you talked about our organization so we're, we're small we're not 20 people um, and the way I, I set it up, I guess, was as a constellation where we have people like Daniel as a fellow. We have some amazing associates who are wonderful people in their own right and do their own projects, but then come in and help us at certain times for specific projects. But we work incredibly hard to a, find the good, the right people who have a resilience and a playfulness that they can they can deal with this despair <laughs> that we're we could be surrounded by really because the the outlook is really bleak um and yet have the optimism and the strength to to act um and to uh, and i at the moment i think that is a, a quality that we we have to have in this time it's the most important thing it's not problem solving it's not being creative it's actually just being able to hold that and still move forward this this you know, potential despair. 
And so, so we work quite hard at that with the team in the best possible way um, to allow them to grow and to learn. And, and obviously it's a privilege to work with John, um, but, but equally it's a privilege to work with, with all of, of the team because they're all from, you know, we have 20 year old students who are just brilliant and 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 so to be able to to forge that i think is really important and and maybe i can you know the next i think for me how how i lead that and how everybody leads wherever they are in the team is really important and the and what i would like to see next is really a shift in how we train educate and how we allow people to learn and unlearn some of the things that there is and this is what we're seeing in the transformations in business, by the way, we are seeing that the insights and the wisdom is there. It's not like we, you know, we are not standard consultants who come in and go, why, right, let's explain to you how you're going to transform at all, which is sometimes quite troublesome because people would love the answers. Instead, we try and ask and the, the really important questions and the questions that allow people to dig into their wisdom, um, the wisdom they've had from working in the organization, but also from life. And if we can do that at a broader scale, um, so instead of focusing so much on on certain skills and actually removing from young people the ability to tap into that wisdom because they're so focused on the grades and the next bits they have to learn off by heart. If we can acknowledge that this is uncertain and nobody knows what it's going to be useful to know. We know that Google's quite good at it, but digging you know holding that uncertainty and being able to really um lead with uncertainty lead your own life and still tap into a, a, a strength that's where you know, that's the next transformation i would like to 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 see happen in the educational space um you mentioned you know we, i work with several business schools as does other people in the team but really going further down than the business schools into to younger people who who need it most right now I absolutely love that. And I, I mean, with transformations, um, a lot of people really haven't been made aware of this or don't understand it. We, we find ourselves in the Anthropocene, deep yeah. in the Anthropocene. And we really need to kind of progress uh, into a new epoch, a new epoch that has positive narratives and positive uh, futures for humanity. I'm calling that the symbiocene. And uh, others have as well um, um, <clears throat> uh, through the book, Earth Emotions, and, and other people yeah. talk about symbiosis and symbi symbiocene and, and regeneration uh, economic or regenerative economic models and things like that. But before we even had the Millennium Development Goals, humanity has always needed to make six major transformations. The one in business and I, I don't know about you, that I've heard about the most is always the digital revolution, the digital transformation. You know, are we prepared for that new pioneering technology, you know, blockchain and, and uh, uh, big data and, and all the other buzzwords, but it's really the digital transformation. Well, that's the sixth transformation that's needed to, to make to get us to that new epoch. The other one is, you know, transformation of sustainable cities and communities, transformation of food and water and land. You know, um, there's there's the transformation of education, health and well-being. You know, just those simple transformations that there are six of them, but those are all required to reach the sustainable development goals, the sustainable development goals paved the way for ESG, so did the triple bottom line and, and the whole taxonomy from the EU. Those six transformations, whether you believe in the goals, whether you don't believe in those, they still are required. And uh, so when you use the word transformations and in and, and Volans, you also call regenerators as kind of a, another form of, of tr uh, trans transformers or tra uh, transformational uh, people trying to get us on the right side of history. There's a lot of work to do. And besides projects, besides that change, I see transformation as something that takes us into a new epoch. Once you've opened that door, you can never go back to the mm -hmm. Anthropocene. You're in that new epoch. You know, it's like that um, imaginal cells from Kim Pullman and Paul yeah. Pullman and that beautiful book. 
that you go from that caterpillar into the chrysalis and emerge as a butterfly and butterfly you can't go back to that chrysalis you know? absolutely yeah. absolutely and no i think that's really interesting um and very true the the danger i i see if i can if i can be frank sure is, please is that we are so set in our mindset that most people, when they hear, I think that those six transformations, which are exactly right, you know, we need to transform education and cities and so on, and the digital transformation, um, they still see it as a mechanical transformation in a sense that, oh, okay, so we move X, Y, and Z, and then this happens, um, where they they don't see the that it's actually a qualitative shift um that transformation as well and 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 that's where communicating in in different ways becomes really important it, it's similar when lots of people are talking about systems change and lots of very good people are then you know drawing big myro mind maps and saying okay so the intervention points are here 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 and when you look at it you say well that would work if this was a machine but actually, we have to acknowledge that we are part of a dynamic living system and we cannot predict um, we cannot predict what's going to happen when you touch that intervention point. And we have to and, and again, it's that thing we have to see it both as the system, but also as the individual. So I would argue that the big transformation um, without sounding um, too soft about it, but I do think it, it comes from the is the transformation of of our, I guess, our confidence, let's call it that, that that we we start trusting what we are as humans, um, that that we we are part of something bigger, and that we have to for, forge that path kind of on our own, despite the fact the system is telling us, for example, that we should just focus on profit and that's the only way to be successful is X, Y, Z. Um, I had a sweet, a really interesting experience the other day where I met some young people and, and I chatted with them and we, it, it was great. They were fantastic. And then afterwards they said, you can't quite believe that you're a CEO. And I said, well, what is a CEO meant to be like then? You know? And so I think, I don't think even think it was gender. It was just the, there is, it's so strong. And we've, we've, we've had decades of a certain image, not just of CEOs, but, but of, of what is needed and what success looks like. Um, and we have to shift that quite significantly. And and I hope we can do it without going into an apocalyptic situation for humanity. I really hope so. You know, yeah. but, but and, and that is my deep hope. But but somehow we have to we have to flip that switch where we we can start thinking differently and transforming ourselves so that when we look at the transformation for cities, when we look at the digital transformation, when we look at the educational system, we are doing it from a different place than where we are now, um, inside. Um, and I think Paul Pullman would, would agree. Um, so what, one of the things we do, you didn't mention, and I probably didn't mention it to you, is we have this um, this uh, book club called, we're yeah. calling it the Green Swans Book Club. And Paul Pullman came that. on, um, a few months back uh, when he had um, just come out with his new book and we talked about love angels, that humans are actually love angels was his, <laughs> the thing that's not in that book, which I love so much. Um, we talked about, we talked about faith and, and how important, whatever faith you have, how important some kind of belief system is to, to this transformation, actually. Um, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, yeah, Net Positive is a great book, but I'm glad that he talked about that. Um, I, I mean, you have to also say that it was uh, in conjunction with Andrew Winston on that book. So yes. there's a lot of yes. wise and, wisdom. Andrew is amazing. Him. Obviously, and, Andrew has, has poured all his expertise into it. He's a good friend. Um, really, I, I admire him so much. It was only because you mentioned Paul, and it was that, that quote about faith that was was really interesting. Um, so, so I think that's there. So I think transformation is important um i know that some of the business leaders that i've worked with have said well I've, I've tried to figure this out and then people tell me i have to go and sit in a forest and meditate before i can transform my business 
what, how can that be? And, and I say, well, you don't have to, because I think that's our job. That's our job as volans. That's your job um, as part of the sustainability regenerative movement. Um, the UN is to allow, fight, allow people to come in through the doorway they can come in through as fast as possible without watering down the principles, without letting them get away with greenwashing, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to we have to push people and, and um, to the door that is most comfortable for them, and then they can go on the journey and 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 start transforming both themselves and their organisation. So we do a lot of that. I think is when we talk about what Volans does is it's about catalyzing, but it's also about bridging um, from this old system that we are standing in. And every leader now has been successful in the old system, and now we're telling them to shift. That's pretty hard, right? That's um, really hard. Because we don't know. And some of the, you know, I've, we, we've been doing some work with the, the Selfridges group, you know, luxury department stores all over the world. And the CEO of that group, one of the things I admire most about her, and there are several things I admire, Anne Pitcher, she, she's born and bred retail since she was 16. She's been on a shop floor, but she knows what she doesn't know necessarily. And she has the courage to, to bring other people in, to listen to them and to take leaps um in that uncertainty and so for me that is it's the courage in uncertainty that is incredibly important um for leaders as we go forward um, i think that's part of this transformation as well we need to meet everyone where they're at and mm -hmm. understand where they're at to help them on the journey the rest of the way that maybe is very alien to them uh, um, of where they're going and where they should go now, with with responsibility, resilience, and regeneration, I think is a, a set of a, a beautiful standard moving forward in resilience, and that's really going to be the next iteration after the sustainable development goals. It'll be the resilience development goals. We already began working on them in two thousand and nineteen. Yes, uh, there's a there's a huge mistake or a huge misunderstanding of the definition of resilience. And you mentioned one, one of the definitions in the beginning is kind of, uh, of, of uh, how a lot of people see that, you know, there's a, the resilience of emotion and mentally, if somebody swears or hits you or, or mm -hmm. spits on you that you have this emotional, mental, physical uh, resilience to bounce back. Then there's the very dystopian resilience where Humanity, you and I are still surviving, but we're wearing a gas mask or a spacesuit or an oxygen mask to, to enjoy what little beauty there could be uh, or just to survive. It's kind of a dystopian resilience and it's very competitive. And it's also, you know, kind of what we see in a lot of the media today. Or there's this other form of resilience that has a lot to do with what we talked about as well in the beginning of this. We're building that infrastructure, we're preparing that path to have, no matter what the climate catastrophe, no matter what the conflict and, and the things that come down the road, the policy, the infrastructure, the way has been paved that we can bounce back the very next day, the very next hour with resilience to have clean water and sanitation, to have clean air, to have food, to have, uh, have business. And so when I hear resilience, that is really important for me. Now, having said that, what I've experienced, I want to see if you've experienced as well. Before the pandemic, before the economic downturn, before the uh, Brexit, before the Ukraine war, before all this craziness we've just been through, um, sometimes I felt like I was talking to I was blue in the face with with organizations and companies are like oh that's expensive that's hard to do I'm used to this old model and uh are you sure and it just the was never there mm. and I hate to say any of these things were a blessing but boy people are knocking down our doors I I, I would imagine for you as well saying we wish we would have listened. We would have had that resilience. We would have had a little bit more stability. We would have had a better plan. Can you help us get back to there? Are you also seeing that? And and, and how do you feel about that? Mm, um, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. The, I think you're right. I think it's we have to be careful with language and resilient. As you as you say, resilience can be seen in 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 several ways. And um, 
I, uh, what that brings up for me is, is actually, um, this is when I say we, our approach is about being creative and human and unlocking. That's exactly it. Because if we can just start from the accepting that uncertainty is going to happen, that means that your transformation, unlike as an organization, unlike a digital transformation from here to here, um, is, is about transforming the capacity to deal with whatever comes next, knowing that you're not going to have a clue what comes next, but you can set up the systems, whether you're talking the global systems, infrastructure, water, et cetera, or whether you're talking organizational systems um, of supporting each other, diversity, so you know you've got all points of view, all those kinds of things um, is really important. So I think that, that's an extremely important point. And I sometimes get sort of quite <laughs> um, animated, let's say, about people when people say, oh, you guys are consultants. And I'm like, yeah, but the consultancy mo model of age is broken because it does not build capacity within organizations. It doesn't build resilience because it's built on the consultancy model. The sort of general consultancy model is exactly the opposite. It's give people something so that they need to come back, um, not to, to build and, and, you know, generously build capacity in the, in the people you are working with. So that's, that's the one piece. So the question, but the question you really asked, which I shall answer as well is, are we seeing that? Yes, we are seeing every organization of weird kinds um, that we were some of many of them that we would not work with because again we're we're, we're we have to pick very carefully because we are small um, wanting to understand how can they do better and that's you know that's fantastic. Is it great it happened because of the situation we're in now? No, I think if it hadn't been a pandemic and an economic downturn, it would have been something else potentially you know something potentially something much worse because we have been heading into this u bend for a while um and and our job now as we are i think hopefully about to go into the last worst bit is 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 setting ourselves up for how to come out um and and the if we pick if we pick the right work we do now then likelihood is we can come out as a better world um, versus the opposite. But it is heartening to see that that everybody is um, that so many organizations and 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 yet and yet I'm gonna hold it. It's still not everybody. I still have people in, if I'm at social events, nothing to do with work, who say, "Oh, sustainability. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's becoming quite popular now. So are you, you know, you're making lots of money off it." And I think, "Wow, <laughs> what?" Uh, you, you know, but that they they see it as a new business opportunity rather than that personal. But the people who allow themselves to be, I guess, whole humans, um, and this is why the school strikes were so important. Um, they um, they are experiencing the issues in the world, and 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 hearing from their children, where are you on this, Dad? And what normally it is dad, I have to say, you know, or mum, but um, but normally it, it's, you know, what are you doing? So what action are you taking with the power you have? Um, you know, I sometimes fall into that trap. Uh, last year when COP26 was in Glasgow, I I really wasn't sure I wanted to go because it sometimes feels like quite a big circus. I know you were there as well. Um, and well, it was a big circus. And it's a big circus. And I sort of said, well, you know, do I want to have the, you know, go and be, participate in this? Is it really going to make the difference? And then I have three children um, from, the, you know, at that time they were 15, 14 to 21. And, and I was chatting with them and they were talking about how they were going to go on the, you know, one of them was going to go to Glasgow for the strikes or, or the marches. One of them was going to do it in Cambridge, da, 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 all different places. And they were talking about how they feel they have nowhere other way of making a difference they you know they're vegan and buy hardly anything new and all those things you that are sort of that you can do but they don't have a voice um and it dawned on me that who am i to say no i don't want to be part of the circus um if i have a voice and i was invited to all these things and actually i there were so many conversations that cop with people who had never thought about these issues before in a real way and who had decided to come to learn and say, and a few of them, you know, they were sort of said you would have had the same. Oh, have I just been asleep at the wheel for the 40 years of my career? Um, when I thought I was being successful. And so 
you know, I went because I feel we all have to really step up and make our voices heard. And it's a beautiful circle back to the beginning where we talked about communications. We have to figure out how to have those conversations with everyone, whether it's, um, you know, on the bus, if, you, if you're in a country that where people speak on the bus, no, don't do that in England, but or, <laughs> or, or, or at work or with your hairdresser or whatever. And, and we have to signal that, that things are, cha- are transforming. And if we still allow ourselves to have, obviously, you know, don't have to have every ser- very serious conversation, but if we don't use what we know and our voices, even in questioning the status quo on a day-to-day level, then it doesn't matter if we work in sustainability. Um, you know, we, we can't, we can't not be activists now. I think that's the biggest thing. And and the joy is that there are so many people in the corporate world who are beginning to take that on personally and in their in their work lives where they have an awful lot of power to shift things. I totally agree. And I mean, for, for me, it's like a habit. It's just, uh, it's ingrained. It's a daily activity and it just never ends. It's it's also, um, it's, uh, I, I, I've, I can't turn the light off anymore. I can't crawl back in that chrysalis. It just is there. Once you see the world in that way, once you understand the, the bigger pictures and you understand that um, in some respects, it is right. There is an opportunity there. So I hate to, to when people say, oh, that's a sustainability is a big business opportunity, some kind of a profit making thing. No, it's just a better business model. When you help a million people, who are suffering with their global grand challenges, you're not a millionaire in a, in a monetary sense, but you're a millionaire in a much deeper sense of seeing the world. If you help a billion people with their problems, you're a, a, bill, a billionaire, but in, a, in not in a monetary sense, in a much deeper way that really comes back multiple fold. And it is a better business model. It's a better model yeah. for life. That's It's the model that works. That's what symbiosis is. It's the way the world has always worked in collaboration and cooperation, not in competition, not in, in this, uh, only, this only the strongest survive, natural selection, uh, severe competition. That's not how the world works. We nope. somehow thought it was, but it just yeah, isn't. It's in now, how it's everywhere, yeah. We bought into economic man, you know, all, all the way, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's it's not the reports, it's not the graphs, it's not the books that really help. It's the good stories and just in your own personal life on 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 a on a local way, uh, or in an organization on a small, very local one to one story. That's how that transformation happens it's uh not this big huge global monster that's overwhelming it's kind of small transformations that happen on individual basis um you know before this time i would always talk about the stern report or the stern review and how you know it's just absolutely proven that it's a better model let's apply it and the outcomes will be much better than business as usual then doing it in this old way um, because a lot of organizations say, boy, it's expensive to be sustainable. It's expensive to be regenerative and, it, and it's not. I think that that's, and you're hitting on exactly why it's now it's it's they're realizing it's expensive not to be prepared for this. It's you a know? huge risk, it's, it's supply big chain, risk. food, everything. Across the board, it is, it, it is a big risk. And, and if we can start, it's fine to start acting differently because you're seeing a risk because eventually you realize that actually it is a huge opportunity um, in so many ways, including for the economic man and the, and the profit line. <laughs> Um, so um, you 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 guys have really started in not only with your uh, Green Swads book club uh, podcast and kind of discussions, you've talked to many uh, different people, but you guys have also started to get involved in um, some education and trainings, uh, kind of to prepare people, not only organizations, and different levels. And there was this. Um, course with the Capital Institute and John Fullerton, you also participated, John participated. 
um, and many others that I'm jealous. I'm jealous I wasn't asked to participate. Oh. Jeremy Lent, uh, uh, you were uh, Hunter Lovins, Alan Savory, oh, Laura it. Storm. I mean, there's a, there's uh, a second Daniel. cohort starting. There's a second cohort starting. I'll oh, put I it drop I'll my name, there. please. I was so I'm so jealous. I wasn't. But it was, you know, wonderful. You you guys uh, talked about regenerative economics, systems thinking, the eight principles of regenerative vitality. Mm -hmm. One, I want to know how, how it went, but I also want to know our, uh, what your feelings are on these new economic models that are emerging. We're seeing the Club of Rome. We're seeing... Um, all these new economic models and saying, hey, these old systems, this old way of looking at capitalism or economics, extractive, neoclassical or, or um, uh, you know, classical economics, it's just not working for us anymore. We need some new ways of looking at it. And you're actually not just talking about those, you're joining forces with these people to create these courses and participate to have those discussions so one i want to know more about that and kind of why is that why are we seeing that give us the insider uh -huh. um so first i would say that I, I feel our part whilst we are a strategic partner of the capital institute for the regenerative economics course uh, you know we I, we're a very small cog and, and part of that and and john fullerton and the team thomas anesto um, Alexandra are brilliant and have pulled it together, I think, in a brilliant way. So it went very well. Um, I think the first cohort had 250 or 300 people, so online. Um, and those people are still, and, and I put our whole team on it as, as participants. So we, we, we did some of the, um, the podcast or the, the, the learning sessions modules, but we, um, everybody got an opportunity from the team to to take part and and it was heavy there's a lot of of content there's so much fantastic stuff that you you know you almost want to go on holiday and and have it and um and um um and and, and then go through the course but um what, what's interesting is it's really it was obvious that there was such a hunger to build a community around it. So people are still in conversation on the on the course platform. Now, four months later, I'm still getting, oh Louise, I saw this. I thought you might find this interesting. You know, people want to collaborate. And and again, it's it's one of the great hopes and sort of, of sources of optimism um, is that people want to make a difference and people want to learn. Um, so that was what that's one economics. Um, course obviously before that and we've had Kate with Donut Economics, Mariana Matucato and, and the mission based um, economy who's um, yeah one of my favorite people to interview actually on the book club so Mariana came on uh, she is a wonderful wonderful woman um, and and I think just for those on on, on the podcast or who are listening, oh, yeah. Mariana Matsukato from Mission Economics, and and she's written several wonderful books, but she's a, she's really great. Kate Rowworth, Donut Economics, so as well. So you've had the best of the best out there. Yeah, um, really, they are both um, you know trained economists who've kind of gone rogues to some extent and come up with these models that work for the planetary boundaries and and for the for the future. Um, I am so thrilled to see that they are gaining traction. It is still very small, um, and but I think there is a lot of hope for it to grow exponentially primarily through the EU, and this is where policy again comes in, because several EU policymakers have really paid attention to both of those sort of strands of economics. Is it enough? No, um, but it but it is growing because it's so obvious. You know, we have we have let the world slip in the standard economics to a point where it's really clear it's not working. Um, you have to, you know, the fact that there is a million people in poverty in the uk um it, really it, it just it's becoming so obvious and that's where the joy of having the younger you know the millennials but then gen z and alphas coming up behind them um they just won't accept this world like this and i think that's when we'll see those economics go further um john fullerton's course again or oh, the um, capital institute course was is fantastic and john has all this experience as a banker for you know decades 
So he knows the ins and outs of that. And he's really worked hard to, to learn and apply that to these principles of what could an, uh, a regenerative econom uh, economic system look like. Um, and there's lots to learn. I would highly recommend it as a course to anyone, but it is, there's a lot of content is what I would say. Um, I've still got a couple I haven't watched yet um, for the, um, but there are also other pieces and, it, and some people might be overwhelmed by the economics part of that. There are lots, and we're seeing this and, and it's interesting, as I said, I work with several um, business schools. I'm on the board of, of extra business school. Uh, which has always been um, focused on sustainability and innovation and is, and, and is doubling down on that. But um, there's a lot of competition from, from other types of, of learning. So you have Laura Storm's uh, Re Regenerators. Regenerative Le Leadership. Yeah. I've got that whole book year, here too. Which, yeah. is, which is a great course. Again, it's more, it's more personal. Um, and you've got a few other courses Um and I, we can put the links up with it. Jeremy, book. yeah, I can put it up as well. Jeremy Lentz in there as yeah, well. Yeah, the Web of Meaning. Meaning That's a great regenerative course. leadership. I mean, it's just one after the other yeah. superstars. I, I'm a, a student of Herman Daly. So um, oh. basically, I'm a, a, I am studied ecological economics and steady state economics with Herman at the University of Maryland. Okay. And have... Um, How lucky. Really... Yeah, I'm very lucky. So uh, I'm a big fan of that. And, and I think that's the direction we're going. Most people don't even know, and I've talked about it before, that there are more than 21 different types of ecological economic models uh, out there. You know, the ones you just spoke about, uh, mission economics, donut economics, uh, there's uh, now the emergence of planetary boundary type yes. of economic models, regenerative economics, shared economics, platform economics, on and on. I could, more than 21, there's probably more popping up all the time. Um, and and so we really, one, the reason they're popping up is because we're, we're sick of neoclassical, micro, uh, uh, macro mm -hmm. economics that just aren't working for us anymore. We wait till the next bubble, bubble emerges and it pops or it doesn't pop and we get a bailout and we go right back to that same system that never worked for us in the beginning. Yes. What What's new? What is working? And then there's, there's a little added confusion because do we do circular economy? Do we do donut economics? Do we do regenerative economics or is it all of those in the same thing and how, how how does that look like how does it work so it's really good that we we understand it we kind of get into that and that's hard because like you said it, it can be you you might need a vacation from the course or you might need to go on vacation to absorb the course but most people don't realize that how much our lives are impacted from economic models wherever we live in the world whatever exactly. how and exactly. we don't we feel like we don't have anything to do with it that's wrong we have so much to do with that and to shape it that's yeah. why it's important to kind of understand that because even if you don't adhere to certain models or to to the way certain governments or organizations or or um, things are working you can yes. create your own internal family yeah. economy your own regenerative self-organization that absolutely doesn't uh, break any laws but it creates this it, new thing yeah no exactly so first of all i am really jealous so i did the classic i you know i did ppe at oxford so that's macro micro straight down yeah. the line economics um snooze <laughs> <laughs> um but um I guess one of the things that again makes me hopeful is you've got people within the finance industry looking at some of this. So you've got people like the wonderful Steve Waygood of Aviva Investors, um, who is basically looking at what are the tools that are being used every day that is a reflection of that economic system. Um, and if we can change those little, those little pieces of tools that the analysts are using to value a company um, to something better, then we're dismantling the existing economic system. And so, so I think that's where, uh, at least that's where I think, oh, I can see the hope in that. Because as you say, the economic systems of, I love that, I think it's Amsterdam who's taken donut economics and said, yeah. right, we're going to apply this 
brilliant. Um, my home city of Copenhagen is looking at the same thing. Fantastic. But as a human being, that's really hard to to deal with. Uh, you know, what what can we do? It just feels so big. And and should is it donut or should you do something else? Um, what, where's the ecological side of that? Is planetary boundaries included in donut economics or not? There, I've, yeah, lots of debates going on. But if people in the finance industry can go, okay, so this tool, actually, I know that this tool, you know, um, discounts the future when I'm when I'm looking at um, the value of a company, then and if we can shift those things, those small things, and and I think there's a resurgence, weirdly, in those small, quite boring things that we don't notice. That similar to contracts law, you know, how contracts are put together make a huge difference to the world and, and how we behave to each other. Um, so those kinds of things are really interesting. And I think I think lawyers and accountants <laughs> and, and sort of bankers who are not the people I would normally um, put lots of faith in because they're, they work on the plumbing. Um, or, they have a huge role to play now um, to A, spot the opportunity for shifts and then start start agitating for some of those shifts somehow so i think that's that's really interesting um b corps of course is one one sort of way of of, of taking that governance piece but there but there are others and yeah everybody has a role to play you i don't know if you we we've covered it or, or if you you mentioned it you guys have a, a strong push now or uh, uh, corporate advocacy projects or transformations that you're doing did did you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that, exactly what that means? Um, yeah, I don't know if we covered it already, but the um, it really is for companies to explore how can they best have an influence in the world. We all know that companies have an influence in how they produce and sell things, of course, how they advertise, but also most companies are involved in trade associations and in direct conversations with government either on, on policy, either national government or local um, government um, or, or pan-European, for example, with the EU. Um, and most of the people who are working within that space um, feel quite alone and they don't really know what other people are doing. And so what we're doing is bringing together a group of, of companies that have ambitions to have a bigger purpose and impact in the world than themselves and, and allowing them to, to learn from each other, looking at other frameworks that could be created from those experiences and from what our research has shown of what is effective. Um, so that they, each of those companies at least, are more effective, and we can spread something to a bigger group of companies. So it should be quite exciting. It kicks off in the in the autumn. I have um, four more questions for you until we're done, and this next one is actually be the hardest one that I've that I've asked you so far. But I prepared you a long time ago, whether you remember or not. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like to you, Louise? What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Oh, uh, so this, I am gathering references to Bucky Fuller. <laughs> Bucky Very Mr. spot on. Um, and I don't remember you preparing me for this. Uh, so, um, but it, I, I think it's quite simple because it links directly to what I consider my personal purpose in life, um, which is about allowing and, and creating the conditions for each human being. Um, uh, what each, and I would kind of, I wanted to, I want to extend it beyond human beings potentially into the animal kingdom to a natural world, but for each person to, flourish and be at their very very best um uh as a as a human that really is it um i i know we, i could describe it with this is what a city would look like and this is but but that is what it is i believe that that will require or will lead to abundance abundance of everything right now we we have lived for many many years in a sense of and a society that accepts scarcity which is where I think the competitiveness and economic man comes from. We've convinced ourselves that everything is scarce when really everything in life is abundant. Um, 
And and if we can tap into that and allow every person to be at their very, very, very best, uh, that doesn't mean you can do everything and that we can all fly or whatever, but that then I think that's the word. I think that's, I think Bucky Fuller would have liked that too. I love it. That's, that's great. Now I, I already in this kind of showed you my favorite book of all time. This, I, I, I love green swans, but I have to tell you, this is my favorite book ever. I've, I've read it dozens of times. Jeremy wrote a section in my book. Um, he's a fabulous man, but I've been looking for years and I've even asked John this question when he was when he was on there, is there one place out there, a university, a book, um, a place to to gain this systemic, this complexity knowledge of the world and how to make sense of it, how to move forward, wh what tools can we do? Some some sense of empowerment or understanding of, of this world, um, of all the things that I'm pretty sure you studied as well, I've studied, you know, I, I'm a graduate of uh, Capra courses from Fritz Hof Capra. I'm a big fan of uh, Bucky. Um, and the list goes on and on, who are all um, environmentalists, uh, great business leaders, great people around that. But I never found a book that really brought it all together and made sense of it and then leave, left you with a good. And that's this. So the question is, is not really telling you my my favorite book but i want to know what's your favorite book that you've ever read you've interviewed a lot of people you've taught i'd like to really know what your thoughts and feelings are what's the best book you've ever read oh my goodness that's hard um so first of all look i've got it here on my um on my table because i'm rereading it at the moment the the best book ever it this it's is, hard, this, isn't this it? It's the hardest question. I, I think this is much harder than <laughs> the view of the world. The um, before this one, mine. I, I don't know if you've ever read Richard Bach Illusions, but before oh. Jeremy's book, that was that was probably. I would have to say that was one of my favorite oh, Richard so Bach Illusions. Illusions was one of my absolute favorite books. I gave it to everyone. Everyone. Me too. Um, gave it, it to everyone. Yeah. It's just yeah. fabulous. And then the other one, it, you kind of you kind of mentioned this as well, because in your answer of what does a world that works for everyone look like, you you said your purpose for existing or your why. And, and one of my good friends, the very first podcast I ever did was John P. Strelecki, The Big Five for Life, The Purpose for yeah. Existing. Uh, it was today Wonderful. a museum day. A okay. fabulous book. Fabulous. Oh my goodness. Great read. Easy. Uh, I always call it the toilet read, but so deep. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, I don't want to yeah. I'm trying to give you time to think. Oh, what, I know, I know. Is. You are. Um maybe I can actually um the and I've have I got a I've got a copy of it here. This is not my this is a copy to give are away. You? So this okay. is not the best, this is not the best book I've ever read, but it's one of the best books I've recently read. And I think it's it's really I think it is really important it's by Julia Bell and it's called Radical Attention and um it's about the battle for attention in this age of distraction it's it draws on so many other books to to be incredibly concise and easy to read uh in fact my daughter stole one of my daughters stole it from me and read it within sort of 10 hours when we were traveling to and from from the netherlands on a train um really really easy uh yeah and it shows that because it has both that systemic piece and it's got the personal piece which i love so it's attention and what we pay attention to and and how we spend our time matters so it's it's less systemic than all those books that you mentioned, which again I love. And and it's funny, the Illusions really was my favorite book for many years. Um also the Daniel Quinn book. Uh what's it called? Yes, I love Daniel um, Quinn's book. Yeah. Um so a couple of Daniel Quinn's book I I love. Um, and sometimes, uh, and I think this is an interesting point potentially, sometimes um those novels, um, non uh, and and fiction books can give us a lot. Another one I would I would mention, which is not to my to hand right now, which I would wave at you, is I do think also the um, uh, Ministry for the Future, 
um I've got that fans right book. here too. Fans book was but Didn't not Stanley Robinson. Read. Yeah, yeah. Um yes, and he I one of the things I did at COP was was co-organize um an event with Club of Rome for Nigel Topping. And then he came um, as part of that. So, so I'm a big fan of that book. Not easy read though. I think Julia Bell would give get my vote for the moment. But yeah, he, but that, that's not an easy read. He, he's a nice person, but it is a good book. I've got it's it. a great book. Right. Um, but this one I would highly recommend. Julia Bell, the ra uh, radical attention, um, short but very very punchy, and I would argue everybody would get quite affected by it. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, I also had the pleasure of of meeting and spending time with um, Sister True Dedication from Plum Village, the Buddhist monastery in, and several of the monastics there in in France uh, this year. And she co-wrote a book with her now passed away uh, teacher Thai, or Tichat Han, and called Zen and the Art of Saving the Planet, which I also think is a book worth reading for most people. But yeah, I I'm not a one one horse person as you can tell i'm I, not either <laughs> I, I do like three to four books a week that i read and and now i've started to go into academic books now because i'm running out of uh of other books but i, I just some i have an addiction it's really bad i feel ashamed sometimes no i think it's, <laughs> but I, again i think this is i think this idea and again comes back to learning and education that that it has to be continuous. And by continuing to read, we nurture our humility that we don't know everything. And sometimes we read books that just enforce that we know stuff, which is also wonderful. But but the to nurture curiosity and to nurture that idea that that things are moving, I think is just it's just so important. Yeah, and I and I really I listen to all the book club podcasts or the uh, videos that you guys do on the book club, and uh, I, I love it. I thank you guys for that work, and and it's, I'm so glad that you and John both have taken the time to to really speak to me and spend time. Uh, not only did I learn that, but my audience really uh, appreciates John, appreciates what you guys do for the world and we need to let them know about what tools who's out there who's supporting who's kind of carrying that banner who's there to help because you, you, you I, I don't want to downgrade you but you guys are humane you're people per uh, people people and mm -hmm. uh and reality and you're you love to see uh us all get on the right side of history the last two questions are really if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners maybe even two two messages as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would those messages be? Mm, uh, that's a good one. The I, I think it would be, and I know this is a contrary to one of the podcasts I heard because he said the opposite, but um, I think we all have to be activists now. Um, and we have to be stubborn, activist optimists is where i would put it that is the most important thing um to really continue to to work and it's fine to take time off and you shouldn't feel guilty for for relaxing or watching tv but but we cannot afford the slumber anymore we cannot afford to kind of drug ourselves with um nonsensical television sugar alcohol, drugs, shopping, and not see and not act. I think that is it's hugely important um, that we all just take just a little step in that direction if we're not already acting. I love how you phrase that because I do believe that some of those things that you listed there make us numb. They desensitize us. They uh, keep us from even being able to see what's going on around us. And um, that's something that uh, in my travels and that I just see that our infrastructures, our models, the things that they're just sorely lacking. They're, they, they're still stuck in the dark ages or the industrial revolution in many respects. And that infrastructure needs to get up to speed with a sustainable future, with a regenerative future. And so I, I, totally agree with you 
what have you learned or experienced in your professional journey so far that boy you say i wish i would have learned that a long time ago <laughs> or that i wish i would have known that experience or had that much sooner oh this is a good one i guess uh we think leaning that leaning into who i am specifically earlier i wish i had had just had the confidence to to know and, and and that it was okay just to be me and not to try to live up to other people's standards, ways of doing things and so on, uh, really. Because the more I do that, the more impactful I am, the more fun I have, the happier I am and the world around me equally. Louise, thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure that's all I have, unless you have something you want to ask me or that you didn't oh, get to say. Now is your yeah. chance. Well, the, um, I have I have a couple of things. <laughs> please, please, right. please. So one was I thought of something. Um, you said I could have two messages. The other one was, sure. and this, it sits a little bit strangely with me because I am a city girl. Like I really am very urban in my upbringing and so on. But I do think that being quiet in nature is an is a message that I would encourage everybody to just try and have for a while just being quiet in nature and that can be the park or you know two inches of grass somewhere it this never fails um and to ask you I would love to ask you what you you, you know you do so many diverse things um and how how you would like I guess people to engage with the podcast and this part of your life, you do, you know, you do so much with companies, with the UN, all over, and then you are still taking the time to, to chat to people like me and, and, and to, to, to get these ideas out. So what, what would you like the listeners of the podcast, I guess, to do or to change um, when they listen to all of them? It doesn't have, not just mine, of course. So I I can tell you a bunch of things. So I'm very, um, I, I take a very systems approach to life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's sheer freedom. So a lot of people think, oh boy, that's a lot. Mark does a lot of things and must not ever sleep or, or whatever. But by taking a systems view approach to life and addressing multiple facets of, a, of a, what could be called a complex system, not only do you solve more human suffering, but you also start to address global grand challenges. And so why I do the podcast, why I uh, speak and work for the UN, why I um, work on you know future projects or work with companies is because I, I want to empower global citizens, anyone I can reach uh, to... With, to live an adaptive lifestyle of health and sustainability, to see that there's much more beauty in this world, that there's models that have been around for a long time, that if we apply them and even do them in a systemic or an autonomous way, life just gets better. Again, not only do, yes, the profits become more, but the, the uh, internal rewards of how your life goes just feels feels a, a, a lot better. And I want them to learn how to live that adaptive lifestyle of health and sustainability within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. And so the advice that I guess is mainly for the podcast, um, our brain processes information and language a lot faster than we can speak it. Mm -hmm. So put the podcast on 1.5, 2.0 speed, because I'm a slow talker. I might say, oh, and I'm a lot of time. But the wisdoms of, of many of those who are on the podcast, you, Louise, John, are, most are authors, CEOs, thought leaders trying to put us on the right side of history. And those questions that I ask you, specifically the one um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you has been different from well over 2,800 people that I've asked that question. It's always been different, mm. um, which is very telling. Yes. We're not cooperating. We're not collaborating as much as we should be. We're 
not all is on the same page. Are we all moving in the same direction? Does that diversity help us to reach that goal? Um, I think it's so vital for us to think about that question for ourselves and, and um, start to formulate our own local economy, our own world in, in the way we want to see the future, to the way we think that it'll work at least at first for us and then hopefully for everyone else. And then start looking around you and if those models and the things you're seeing in the world aren't that way, Start having conversations, like you said. Let's let's have those conversations. Let's communicate, and let people say, "Hey, I disagree." Let's be activists. Let's change those policies. Let's try to shape those. Let's change the way our business works, so that that outcome, that roadmap, those plans or goals to get there will be the one that we decide. Um, because if you don't know the answer to those questions, if you've never thought about it it's most likely that you'll never get to that. You'll Someone else will push you in that direction. You're kind of like a ship without a rudder or without a plan yes. or a roadmap. That's a great answer. Thank you. No, You're I'm very, most uh, welcome. Um, thank you very much for, for doing this and all the work you do. And um, I'm very proud to be included in this bit. It's been a sure pleasure. It's, it's been a great, a great podcast, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure it's going to go really well. Thank you very much, Louise. No Thanks. Take care. Tell John and everyone hello. I will do. See you soon. Bye. Bye.